Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we've got a really great group of experts here to talk about the so-called gig economy and how you unionize or enable workers to have the protections that they so often do not have. Um, you know, I, just as a way of starting the discussion, um, when you look at the United States alone, you have 30% of the workforce that are now independent contractors. And um, I'm just going to kick off with our panel by asking, is it time that we change the definition of employee? I mean, I don't think that that is where our lawyers and our political system is focused. Mm -hmm. I don't think that really is the key question. I think the key question is, in the 21st century, how do you construct mm -hmm. a regime that allows people who go to work every day, regardless of what they call them, to get a decent amount of benefits and security that their parents and grandparents once had. And f focusing on the employee question is important for some group of people, but it's somewhat like trying to put the genie back in the bottle of a way of work mm -hmm. that doesn't exist anymore. I would, I would answer that by saying yes. I mean, I think it's a very good and appropriate question. I think that um, for a company like ours, GLG, we, we think of ourselves as the uh, tinder for business. You know, we connect experts uh, with uh, businesses who have uh, problems they're trying to solve. And we have uh, tried to extend to some of the independent contractors we work with uh, benefits that uh, we would like to provide. But because the way the laws are written in the US, but, but everywhere we do business, both in our businesses focused in the US and in Asia and in Europe, and everywhere we do business, we run into the problem that the definition of what it means to be an employee restricts us uh, in, in providing the kind of benefits that we would like to and, and means that if we undertake to provide benefits, we have to, un you know, the law prescribes a whole series of other benefits we have to provide. So I think that we have to update the laws and update the rules in a very fundamental way to reflect this new way of working. So, Oshin, uh, you're, you're sitting here as obviously the r resident um, of the gig economy, or this, uh, the representative, I should say. Uh, well, you know, he, he's the resident of the gig economy. <laughs> <laughs> but you, he, you, he, he, would, he was doing it far before we were. <laughs> I mean, you know, you operate a, 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 um, you know, a massive company like Handy, which I'm sure many of you f are familiar with. Um, and so what, are, what is your company doing? to address this issue of benefits for those who are working part-time or temporarily with Handy? Look, I, I think you're absolutely right that the employer-employee question is just one part of it, but it's a really, really important part. And at Handy, we've got over 100,000 people that have earned money as cleaners, handymen, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, all sorts of trades. And the question regularly becomes, how do we make sure that we give them the best experience? And these folks are choosing to work on Handy because it gives them amazing flexibility. They come to Handy, they go through a rigorous onboarding and vetting process, much like I'm sure GLG do. And what we do next is we give them the opportunity to earn money in an incredibly seamless way. So they don't put in bids, they don't negotiate price, they just see a price for a job, they see a particular job, and they can claim and work that job. That flexibility is what is drawing people into this segment of the economy. The 30% of people who are uh, independent contractors are drawn in by this flexibility. But I think we do have this opportunity now to figure out what's the best way to keep helping this part of the workforce have access to benefits, have access to more education and training, but preserve that flexibility. And I think that's the challenge that, so, that we've got. So what is the best way? How do you, how do you um, approach that challenge? So there are laws right now that are restricting us. So if you take it and you parse it into different pieces, you've got a legislative effort, which is to say, okay, can we actually affect real change? Can we go out there and help educate legislators that there is a better way to classify folks in this part of the economy? And I think that's something we've been very forward on. We've put forward legislation in multiple states. We've leaned in and said, hey, we're willing to fund some of this. As a platform, we're willing to say, hey, Handy's willing to pay for a part of the benefits that folks need. In terms of education and training and the day-to-day -day that like is on the ground, 
we really want to make sure that we educate people, but not cross that line. And we use a lot of digital means, so we give people access to a lot of content to self-educate, but we don't cross that line into training today. So I think those are largely the two parts that we're working on. It's how do we improve legislation? How do we educate people on how they can get involved in it, impacting the legislation? But also, how do we use the technology without crossing the line to actually educate people today? So Andy, what, what, what do you think that companies like Handy should be doing? How, how, what structure would you like to see put in place? First of all, Handy is one of the few that really are out there trying to figure this out as opposed to throwing it up in the air and saying, I can't do anything. So I, And I, it's great that he's here, right? I mean, it, yeah. it's great that you're here with, this, with us on yes. this panel, willing to talk about these issues. And I think that that speaks to the fact that, you know, you, you guys are trying to figure out what we're all trying to figure out together. Sorry to so interrupt That's you. okay. So I would just say, if you take this in a historical context, when there was, people did agricultural work for a living, they self-managed their work life. We then changed to an industrial economy. The employer managed your work life, your benefits, your retirement, your career, your training. And unfortunately, when we first did it, we had lots of problems. We had children at work. We had excessive hours. We had no minimum wage. And we eventually constructed guardrails a regime to try to respond to the way that work was done. We now have to disrupt the current regime and reconstruct a regime to fit this current one. So I think it looks like this. One is what the national governments do. So there are certain things I don't think have anything that employers should be responsible for. Healthcare, I would say, is not an employer responsibility. It's a national responsibility. A social security or a national retirement system, I think, something to do with workers' compensation or disability. You could add on leave or other kinds of things. There's just certain levels of benefits that are not employer-based anymore, that stop portability, entrepreneurial activity. That's one group. Then there's a second group of benefit that Oshin talked about, you know, that are more employee-specific or more employer-specific, like training, or like, you know, how do I build my own retirement savings over time? And I think there the question is, what money comes from the customer? In New York City, there is a tax on every Uber ride that you take of 2.5%. It goes into a fund. It provides workers' compensation. At 5%, you could provide people with a whole series of additional benefits. That's five, 50 cents on a $10 ride. Or as Oshin and others have talked about, you could match between workers and employees. So I think there is a way to create a portable system that is not on employers, but where employers contribute and employers get what they need, like education and training. And we need to exempt those activities from making people a traditional employer, as Richard and Oshin said, and bringing every other possible problem into a, what is now what workers desire is a lot more flexibility. You probably agree with everything he just mm. said, right? I do. Can we, can we get I this mean, guy I mean, why don't office? you, you should like, me. you two should get together and make this happen. You guys are supposed to disagree more and then I mean, like, I'll engaging. bring you together. <laughs> wait, wait, are you going to charge a VIG? I'm bringing this <laughs> together. Gonna, I'm going to charge a fee for it, but, but it'll be part of the gig economy. All right, I'm in. Let's do it. Did you, uh, Richard, want to chime in on, you know, some of the solutions that you think would be necessary to implement? Outside well, of the I, I mean, I think that we find ourselves in a very unusual period, right? I mean, I think you are right that, that um, you know, we, I, I, at the dawn of the industrial age, we had to shift. The kind of shift we saw then is the kind of shift we're probably just, we're, we're maybe not at the very beginning, but we're like towards the middle of the beginning part of it. And, and it requires uh, work with government. It requires uh, informed uh, uh, companies and informed entrepreneurs like Oshin who are willing to take a fresh look at, at this stuff and not just say, not just put their own economic interests first, but put the economic interests of workers first. Um, so it takes a, a, a public-private partnership. Um, we at uh, GLG are trying to fund some research around this. You know, we're we're at the heart of what we do is provide expertise to companies, and we're trying to fund some research around this. So I think it will in, will will include a, a major effort, which is which I think I see starting to come together by government, by entrepreneurs, and by uh, you know think tanks and and everybody to figure out the way forward. And and you know the fact that we're talking about it here at this major summit with 60,000 people here is um, is also part of that effort. But, but but let me add one thing to this, just reflecting on my life, you know, people don't give up these things usually without an intermediary organization that's putting pressure. Or with mm -hmm. a fight. You mean without a, a fight. fight. 
you know, <laughs> unions weren't built in the industrial era because a group of policymakers and academics and businesses got together. It got together because there were a lot of people forcing change. The same thing's true with our civil rights movement in our country. The same thing's true with marriage equality. People fought for the change. It wasn't a, just a question of policy. It was a question of power and not just the power of persuasion. And so I think the missing link here, and this is a union responsibility, is what kind of workers' organizations are going to grow up to play the appropriate role in this moment of history that's different than when they were representing 50,000 workers in a Flint, Michigan factory. I mean, that is not the workplace of today. There is an additional role for workers' organizations. Unfortunately, my community has not stepped up to have 60,000 innovators across the way with new ideas about how to build workers' organizations. They're trying to put the genie back in the bottle, and change is inevitable. It's progress that's optional, and the question is, can some group of younger leaders, workers, entrepreneurs step into the space to become the intermediaries here that bring together the workers' interest to bargain, so to speak, not in a traditional collective bargaining sense, but legislatively and otherwise with entrepreneurs and government. Well, I would Actually, say that I it's good that you're here. I mean, it's good that you're, you're that person. I mean, you're the person who's urging that more than anybody. And, I, you know, we're, I, I think that uh, you're, you're that person and you're here and you have to, like, uh, encourage well, other people I'm an people old to person. Step. We need young people. <laughs> you are, Andy, you're young <laughs> at heart. Is one such you're young at heart. You had something there's, you wanted to add to that. There's a whole lot of people who are far more conservative who are talking about this in a very different way. And I think that's the challenge we've got. So we've got folks who are way, way, way more stuck in their ways who are saying, hey, how can I make sure that every person in the gig economy still remains an employee? How can I try and put that person back in the box of an employee to use your put the genie back in the bottle? And that's some of the challenge that we've got here. And I, I don't know where exactly or when exactly we're going to see that shift. I think we've been talking about this. You know, we've been doing versions of this conversation now for three years. You know, I think the tone has changed. Companies have leaned in, unions have leaned in a little, but there's still a big gap. And I don't, I don't know to your point, is it an organized, you know, an organized gig economy labor representative that's needed? Is that what we're missing here? But it does need a catalyzing force. It needs someone to say, hey, you know what? This is important and it's important now. And it's important that we actually, you know, there, there's one group that's not represented on this stage, and it's it's a strange one. It's the lawyers, because the lawyers yeah. are actually the only group here that are actually loving the status quo, because <laughs> yes. they're making bank right now. <laughs> well, actually, you know, you, what you've touched upon is something that I wanted to ask about, because, you know, I work for The Guardian. I'm a journalist. Uh, we uh, recently unionized for Guardian U.S., you know, we've got the News Guild that is there to work with us. But internally, we're able to meet in the office or somewhere else. We have a massive email chain where, you know, we can add people to the list and we can effectively have this conversation about what rights are we seeking, what, what you know, changes to our benefit structure are we seeking. What, you know, I know that in, with, in New York, some Uber drivers create a Facebook page, you know, Uber Drivers Network NYC. But the problem is that it's harder for them to use the same tactics that have traditionally been um, utilized by those who are able to, uh, you know, actually contact one another, which they can't and do through some person, of these apps. Right. The whole nature of the, the the whole nature of work has changed, so these people can't even meet in person. Most of these people don't even know each other. Exactly. So what are so so, so part of it might just have to be, you know an organization that is more effectively representing uh, some of these workers, but what are some of the tactics that can be utilized by those who don't even have the ability to communicate? So, you know, A, I don't think anybody's ever built a very successful business model with a lot of, add a lot of investment. In our country, when the unions were formed to represent industrial workers, the money came from pre-existing unions making an investment in the future, yep. just like people do Series A and Series B and Series C. So the idea that somehow workers are going to rise up, you know, like the Uber drivers going on strike today, yes. are, are going to sustain a permanent organization with no income, no investment, is just crazy. To reach a, a customer for handy, I don't know how much they invest for every acquisition. Can you imagine a union has the same cost of acquisition? So until there are social impact investors, philanthropies, other people who see a need to create intermediaries and are willing to invest in it, you know, we're just going to have a mismatch of power between a lot of investment in capital and company building and no investment 
in worker organization building, and unless the existing unions, who have failed to step up and move resources into entrepreneurial activity, do that, it's just going to be a big problem. And then the problem becomes that, like Waymo the other day, was going ahead, getting a bill passed to allow for driverless trucks to be tested in the U.S. The Teamsters Union, the biggest trucking union in our country, woke up at the end of the entire process and said, we don't like it, and stopped it. I guarantee you that's going to cost Waymo $50 million of lost opportunity before they can now. So, like, we need to understand there's actually a reason for everyone to find a solution to reduce friction to make your business investment work. You know, to, to spend your life in lawsuits with lawyers about are these employees or employers is just a costly expense. And so I think entrepreneurs and investors and venture capitalists have to rethink a model that tries to take some of the friction out by thinking about the worker question and the organization question on the front end, not when you lose your TFL license, you know, and now all of a sudden you're willing to make all these concessions in London that you wouldn't make earlier on, which you should have made. And I, and I think that ultimately a large part of the solution has to come from government. I think that as, as uh, more and more of, as more and more voters are, are participants uh, f you know, in the gig economy full time, and as, m and as a greater percentage of populations both in the, in the US and in Western and Eastern Europe participate as part-time workers, I think that they will require democratically elected governments to, um, to you know, think about reform and impose some kind of reform. And I, I, I think it's inevitable. So I think that um, smart companies like Handy will come together with uh, representatives of government and at places like uh, the Web Summit here and, and, and be part of that change ahead of time. And that's why we're happy to participate too, even though we're kind of like a different kind of uh, gig economy company. We're, we like, we're kind of like uh, Uber meets Harvard, right? Where the, where the workers are all very high skilled and, and the jobs are very high paying and highly desirable. But you know what, what, what a company like ours, what GLG demonstrates is that um, while, while independent working uh, may be the future of work, it, you know, these, these low-paying, uh, no-benefit jobs do, do not have to be synonymous with the gig economy. The gig economy, you know, where people work independently can work for workers, can provide a living wage, can, can, there can be a structure within which people are treated with dignity and they don't have to kill themselves and they can have health care and they can have a living wage. And, it, you know, independent work is not synonymous with taking advantage of workers to the advantage of the employer. It can work. It just will require a fundamentally rethinking of this by government, by organized labor, and by informed employers. Yeah, I think that the idea that low-paying jobs are solely 1099 or solely in the W-2 fast food sector is like a total misnomer. And we've got to figure out how to solve that perception. But if you think about like what is actually needed and you were to imagine recreating the voice of labor in like venture terms or in entrepreneurial terms, you would throw out the whole idea that we need to get people together in a physical space. Right. You'd say, hey, what's the best medium for us, it wouldn't be the break room at The Guardian. It would probably be a totally different way to think about how to organize labor. You'd reconsider the value prop. You wouldn't say, hey, the value prop is going to be, we're going to figure out when to go on strike and how to get you, uh, how to get, how to, get you to increase your wages 5% a year. You'd reconsider what exactly people want today. So it's the medium, it's the value prop, it's the means, it's the way in which you would speak to folks. It's a totally different concept versus the labor union of the past. And I think that what we're missing today as uh, like tech companies, we're missing a counterpart that we can engage with so we can actually have this conversation. So if we're putting forward a bill that says, hey, you know what, Handy will cover X percent of you know, a contribution, the response on the other side needs to be, all right, well, it should be 2X. Instead, it's, no, 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 like we gotta go back and like let's put these folks back as employees. And I think that's what's missing. And, I don't know, is it venture money or is it us figuring out how to do it? But it's strange that tech companies need to figure out how to seed the voice of labor. It's like a weird well, yeah, thing. I mean, I, I, the, one of the last things I wanted to do and never did when I 
left my union seven years ago was to create the X Prize <laughs> for a new form of worker organization yep. and get all these smart people over there to say, here's $5 million for someone can figure out a different way to represent workers in the new economy with the new tools that are now available that weren't available. So it was great to have tools such as everybody worked in the same building and this lived in the same neighborhood. Now it's an interesting tool to be able to talk to everybody around the world who work for Uber, you know, if you could figure out a way to do it. And so, you know, we just have not put energy into, as a country, as an OECD, as anything, into investing into startups to find different forms of workers' organizations as we have into all kinds of other things. And I think until that happens, you're going to count on, you know, traditional legacy organizations who used to be staffing companies and didn't get the world was changing. You know, unions, unfortunately, at times are very legacy organization who doesn't get the world's changing. And until they get run over, they don't change. And then by, like, Eastman Kodak, it's usually too late, or Blockbuster, you know, to be the next generation of things. And I just think, as odd as it seems, like, government has to be an incubator, mm -hmm. you know, which they don't want to do because people like me and unions hate it, you know, but to find ways to create new forms of, to represent workers. And I just want to say one more. You're absolutely right. This is not about the gig economy. This is about precarious work. This is about zero-hour contracts. This is about part-time work, staffing companies, all kinds of ways people avoid responsibility of major employers like a, a Google who hires its security or cleaners through a different medium so that the people don't pay and get the same benefits as their existing workers. And now, the gig people have aggregated this in a way you see it. But this is a trend that is killing you know, equality in our country, countries and is promoting Brexit and Donald Trump and everything that goes but, along with but, it. But I want to ask you, so, so, you know, I mean, the people in the tech world are not necessarily like the most politically conservative people. I mean, there, there are a lot of very forward thinking, like this gentleman here with us to my right. Uh, there are a lot of people who, who um, you know, they're concerned about entrepreneurial gains and making money, but they're, they're also concerned about society. So why do you think it has been so hard to get major players in the tech community to step forward and address this issue? Do you think it's just that, like, they've got too much else going on, or do you think it's happening, or what can we... I what think can they everybody have to call GLG, <laughs> say we have a problem, like Tinder, right. and we need to find a partner... Oh, now you're blaming you know? me. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just saying... <laughs> I think the, the question is that people keep looking for these far-fetched ideas, or they look for existing organizations to become something they're not, rather than what we do in the other room, which is we invest money, we give pitches, and we try to build something different and new that actually works for workers, right? And so if unions aren't going to stand up in their current form, then how do we stand up and how do governments and people who are chasing Oshin down to try to get him to open his business here, you know, get together with their OECD partners and say, you know, if we can't figure out this problem, people like Oshin don't want to go to another country where they're just being hassled about are they a bad employer or a good employer. Uber doesn't want to get chased out of Brazil. You know, so someone needs to step in here because in the absence of it, we see what happens. Is the legacy institutions like taxis fight to keep out the new players. The legacy institutions like unions try to make people employees. I mean, the script is pretty clear. We've lived it for five or ten years. The question is, who's the entrepreneur and the investor that's going to say, let's build something that looks really different, that works for everybody? And if you look at where this has happened most successfully, like if you look at the gray market economies where they've actually pulled these low-wage gray market businesses or gray market services out of the gray market, you look at Sweden, you look at Norway, you look at Switzerland, they put in place massive employee incentives and household incentives to get the work off the books, or sorry, onto the books, so to get it out of the gray market. Because there's raw economics at stake here where there's some percentage where people are gonna say, all right, you know, I'm okay with paying this. And there's another percentage where they're just gonna disintermediate handy, they're gonna disintermediate the union, and they're gonna go directly to the household to sell services. And that's the challenge with this part of the economy. You think about cleaners, handymen, plumbers, they always have another option, which is to sell directly to the household. And if the spread is too big, if the, like the percentage take, whether it's Handy's take, whether it's a union's take, whether it's the take for uh, social services is too big, they're just going to go around that and they're going to sell direct. Mm -hmm. And where you've seen it most successfully done, it's actually state supported. So 
Switzerland has stepped in and they've essentially made it cheaper for the household to buy the services if they buy it legally. The same in Norway, the same in Sweden. And I think that speaks to what you're talking about, which is a real need in this part of the economy for the state to step in if they want to keep it on the books. Oshina, one thing that you've talked about is a portable benefits vehicle. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on what that model looks like? And, you know, I know that was something specifically in New York that had come up for debate on a policy level. If you can maybe illustrate that with an example. Sure. So we put forward legis legislation in concert with a couple of unions, a couple of academics, a couple of legislators, which said, hey, in exchange for clarity that the folks that work on Handy will truly be contractors, that the, where, there will be a sandbox and we will experiment with this, we would put forward a percentage of uh, as percentage of Handy's earnings, and the um, the contractor could also make a contribution into a fund that would be managed in concert with a union that the individual could use to decide what benefits they needed to buy. So if they already had health care because of their spouse or because of someone else in their family, they could use that money to buy uh, retirement savings or they could use it to fund days off. So it was a mechanism by which they could essentially fund the purchase of benefits in a tax-free way, and Handy would make a contribution to that. Unfortunately, the legislation is still uh, contested. Mm -hmm. But it's a starting point. Now, I know that the SEIU had a slightly different uh, take on a, a proposal like that, but, you know, Andy, where would you like to see maybe potentially that as a way, as some room for negotiation? No, I, mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, strict, the tricky question, which is chicken and egg, is do we have to change the law with the benefits, or can we change the benefits without changing the law, or how much of the law do we have to change to just say you have a safe harbor if you just provide the benefits, but we're not giving you more clarity? Because I think one of the New York problems is, you know, people are saying now we're changing the law about independent contractors. This is more than the gig economy. What does it mean for tax benefits and tax? And so, you know, it's hard to find a situation like we do have in New York with a black car fund that's pre-existing, where there's a tax of 2.5% on your Uber or Lyft ride, goes into a fund and provides benefits, you know, but it's been established that those are independent contractors. Right now, we're still having the independent contractor fight within the benefit fight, and it just complicates it because there are people who want to have the independent contractor fight who don't care about benefits. There are people who want to have the benefit fight who don't care about independent contractor, and we've not found the right marriage. And then on top of that, there are many, you know, platforms who are going around the country trying to exempt themselves from any responsibility, which makes them not really trusted people in places, you know, if you can do it in Texas, but then you come to New York, people think this is just situational ethics. You don't really have a, you know, a policy position. You just have, I got to do it here to do business. I don't have to do it in Texas, so I'll screw the people in Texas to help the people in New York. And so, like, we've not yet found the right kind of mix and match to match, I think, a solution that does exist with a political process right. to enact it. You haven't, you haven't yet, we haven't yet found the right political motivator, the right the right political chemistry to bring all the sides together. And I, I mean, I think it's fascinating that we are at this stage of this debate where clearly we're talking about it. Clearly there are some solutions on the table, uh, um, but, but there isn't quite yet the political will. There isn't quite yet the, uh, the prioritization of these issues uh, within this context to, to come up with a solution. And it will probably take, you know, it, as it does, you know, political movements are created when there's a crisis. I mean, you know, some of the movements that Andy referred to, I mean, the, 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 you know, the great gains that were made by the labor movement were made when conditions became so horrible that people died, you know? Uh, the great gains uh, around the LGBT rights movement, which I was involved in, uh, only happened when there was when there was when there was real darkness, you know, around when there was the AIDS crisis, when Proposition 8 passed in California, which t took away rights from people. So it, it may be, unfortunately, that that there will have to be some kind of crisis in this area in order to create the political motivation. You hope not, but but the but the well, history there's of these be a, the crisis is very simple in a blue state like Washington in our country that has a law introduced now for, I don't know, 20%, not 5%, 20% is going to create a moment, if it looks like the legislators are interested, that will force everybody 
to get together at a table and say that's way that that's going to just destroy the business if that's what you want to do fine but i would just say i hadn't thought about this you know if we were all smart the three of us and others we would go to the gubernatorial candidates in the state that silicon valley exists in california for the 2018 election and we would sit with all of them and propose or negotiate a series of solutions because if you do it in the home state of venture capital and startups, Silicon Valley, you will create a model that is replicable. And the people running for governor there, I think, all have a much more open mind about finding a solution than they may have in other places, you know, where it is not a, such a big part of their economy. I, I think that's a great idea. I will, I will do it, and I will go with you. If you'll, if <laughs> you will in. go. Will you go? I'm in. When are we going? <laughs> you got. You have a deal right here. I'll come and I'll write about it. Are you going to come I, with I, us? Will you come I with will, us? I'll come with you. You can moderate. Yeah, this is the beginning of a very special partnership. <laughs> will you um, write nice things, though? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I'm uh, serious. We should go. The I want to give you guys a chance to offer the, our guests here a parting thought, um, if, succinctly if you can, but just something that they should take away, what you think they should really take away from this discussion, and Andy, we'll start with you and we'll go down the line. So, you know, again, change is inevitable. We should not try to imagine we're going to stop change. It's progress. The question is for workers, and I think there are enormous number of solutions available, and the focus really now has to be bearing down to stop talking about it and start testing some of them. Uh, I would agree with all of that, and uh, and I'm actually quite serious, and I think Andy makes a very generous and, and serious offer that uh, the three of us should should do that in California. We should get others to come with us from, from our various constituencies, and I, I really do think something good could come, out, come of this. One, we're going to California, it would seem. <laughs> <laughs> Two, I would say that we need to take the model that we've got in entrepreneur land and apply it to the rest of the economy, which is a willingness to try things out and acknowledge that we don't have the right answer. There are too many variables changing right now in labor. There are too many variables changing in the economy. There's too many variables changing in technology. There's no way that we're going to sit here and say, hey, even if we spend the next five years planning this, we're not going to get it right the first time. We need a sandbox. We need to start testing things. And then the third thing is I think we do need a voice for labor, and it needs to be a real voice. And it's not challenged by the fact that we can't get people together. It's not challenged by a lack of communication. It's challenged by the fact that the message isn't right. The value props aren't right and the message isn't right. And that's what's not resonating with people today. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I'm truly grateful to all three of you for having this discussion. And I hope that everyone uh, found it to be uh, as um, thoughtful as, as I did. And uh, it, it seems we are going to California. So once we're through with Lisbon, uh, whoever else wants to come with us. Um, I think the, goal, the message here was that you have to be part of this, though. Um, everyone has to play their part um, in, in determining how we operate within uh, this new normal of uh, what it means to be a worker in this so-called gig or sharing economy. Oshin and Richard and Andy, thank you so much. Thank of course, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good.